Good morning, everyone. My name is Anton Johnson, as Dr. Jackson just mentioned. I am a graduate research associate at the Center for Clinical and Translational Science, the BroodX meeting organizer, and your MC for the day. So again, welcome to BroodX. As you heard Dr. Payne and Dr. Jackson mention this morning, BroodX is really a different type of scientific meeting. You won't hear uh, long introductions from the speakers. We want to get straight to their ideas. Uh, there will be no high-fiving or booing from the stage. We want you to be the judge of the ideas that you hear today. And we can promise you that you will each walk away from BoodX today with something new. Uh, but in order for that to happen, you have to be completely here. So we ask that you silence your cell phones before our speakers come out. Without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started and get to the show. Our first speaker joins us from the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences and has a passion for cancer survivors that is deeply rooted in personal experience and intellectual curiosity. Please help me welcome to the BroodX stage, Dr. Colleen Spees. It has been said yeah that the fate of a seed can largely be determined by the soil in which it is planted. And we clearly know this because we can do experiments and take two seeds and plant one in a toxic environment and one in a nutrient rich and nourishing environment. And we can see that one plant withers while another one thrives. I wonder if the same principle can hold true for cancer survivors. Can we take cancer survivors and plant them, so to speak, in a new environment, one that is cancer free or one that is nourishing to their soul and nourishing to their body? You see, I think we can. And I believe that because never have we had as much evidence as we do today to show us the interconnectedness between nutri nutritional health and our personal health. So my story begins in Northeast Ohio, where I was born one of seven children to an Irish Catholic family. This is me, the easily distractible one, <laughs> probably checking out someone's like awesome jewelry in the corner. And um, you know, I feel like I had a relatively normal childhood. It was filled with faith, family, friends, and this thing called cancer. You see, I don't recall a time when cancer wasn't a part of my life. Our family, especially with our extended families, attended more funerals than we did weddings. So by the time I was just seven years old, my brother pictured here was diagnosed with lymphosarcoma. Sadly, he succumbed to the disease just five years later when I was 12. Cancer struck again close to home for my family in 2007 when my sister pictured here on the left was diagnosed with breast cancer. So this is difficult. My sister ended up going to a genetic counselor because she was very young who confirmed our family's worst fears. We were affected by an autosomal dominant gene mutation known as lee fermini syndrome or LFS. Now lee fermini syndrome affects the tumor suppressor gene called TP53 in the body. This gene encodes for P53, which is a protein. This protein is very special because it's known as the guardian of the genome. I think of it as the superhero of the genome. So what happens is when P53 recognizes a rogue cell in the body, in my mind, it dons its cape, escapes the phone booth, and travels about the genome to put a stop to that rogue cell to restore order to the genome. Very important. But with Lee Fermini syndrome, the superhero is basically stuck in the phone booth. And when that happens, and you have this dysregulation of your tumor suppressor mechanisms, what happens is that rogue cells divide out of control, and you have the beginning of carcinogenesis. So what now? What do you do when you find out your family is affected by a horrific, mutation. That's hereditary, and we all have children. Well, first you cry, and that's what we did, and then we got sequenced because we needed to know what we could do. So I was a negative, and it's the one time in your life you want to be a negative, right? 
And then uh, here we have my brother, who is a positive. So since after sequencing, he was diagnosed uh, since this time with prostate cancer and T-cell lymphoma. These are my sister's two biological children. They both are positives. So being a dietitian of 25 years and a healthcare provider, I felt this great need to find some answers. So I immediately turned to the literature and just did these lit searches and trying to find something that would help us and help other people with this terrible disease. And what I found was some great molecular research, some of it done right here at The Ohio State University, but I wasn't finding anything that was translating forward to get to the cancer survivors themselves. And that was disturbing for me. So with the help of the CCTS in 2008, I went back to school. I wanted to study P53 and cancer progression. So this is me in 2011 on graduation day. You can tell I'm pretty happy. <laughs> but I also was ready to go. I was ready to fight this. So here, uh, let me tell you what we do know. We know that 5 to 10 percent of cancers are genetically linked. We also know that 90 to 95 percent percent of cancers are linked to modifiable lifestyle behaviors. And this is very important because of the 95% linked to environment, we have diet and obesity accounting for about 55% of that. So this tells me, could there be hope? Is DNA our destiny? Perhaps it's not. Perhaps we can modify lifestyle behaviors to promote optimal health, to reduce the onset of disease and extend it for those with cancer prevalence? Or can we actually reduce the progression or the aggressiveness of disease? We also know that still, with all this information we have, over 90% of US adults fail to meet the dietary recommendations for cancer prevention and survivorship. This is astounding astounding. We need to do better. So how can we change it? Enter the Garden of Hope. The Garden of Hope is a three-acre urban farm located at Waterman Farms right here on the campus of The Ohio State University. It became, it became um, available to cancer survivors in 2012 after conversations between the Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Center, the College of Agriculture, and James Care for Life. To me, the garden represents what is the most beautiful part of a land-grant university. It is a great model for how to do things. The collaborations here truly run as deep as the soil. So since 2013, I've been conducting research at the Garden of Hope. It is a living laboratory. Now this is Jack. He's one of our cancer survivors. He came to us at a very vulnerable state, like most of our cancer survivors do. You see, Jack had just got off of active cancer treatment therapies, and now he was transitioning back to his new normal. And most of our survivors come to us at a time like this, and with this, they're very susceptible because they've just lost this cancer team that was working with them so diligently. They gave them their balloons and said, good job, you're free to go, right? And now they come out and go, what do I do next? Where do I go, what do I do? So Jack came to us trying to seek answers. One of the things we do is provide them access to the beautiful garden where they can harvest fresh produce, fruits, vegetables, and herbs several times a week. And you can see some of our survivors here in the garden. The main goal of our intervention is to improve adherence to the evidence-based guidelines for cancer prevention and survivorship. And we do that with a multifaceted comprehensive approach that is theory-based and evidence-driven. and evidence -driven. What we provide them is group education classes focusing on the, each one focusing on one of the separate guidelines taught by an expert in the field. We provide them, as you can see here, cooking demonstrations and taste testing from the things they bring in that very day and harvest. We show them how to use it, safe food handling practices, taking home recipes. We also provide them novel e-technologies where they can track their progress, 
they can connect remotely with a registered dietitian who acts as a health coach for them. And this dietitian can help, help them to set goals, to help them better manage their disease, and to monitor and to also applaud them and encourage them. We also have them come out, like we said in the, I showed you in the last slide, come out and harvest up to two to three times a week. And we have a huge service learning component where we have students walking with them as well and harvesting. So how are we doing? This is results from a pilot study. I'm only going to show you one slide because it's being presented nationally just next week. Um, this was a pilot feasibility pilot in which we took, grabbed some data. And you can see in the green, this is a waterfall plot where we have sig shown significant increases in produce intake. We also showed in this pilot study significant decreases in red and processed meat consumption, significant decreases in sugar-sweetened beverages, and our clinical markers showed significant decreases in blood cholesterol, fasting blood glucose, and increases in skin carotenoids. Now these are amazing results from a pilot study, so we were very excited. This year, we took it one step further. We know that 50% of cancer survivors are overweight or obese, and this is directly related then to increasing risk for secondary cancers, for a recurrence of their primary cancer, for future comorbidities, and for all-cause mortality. So you can see this is hot off the press yesterday, and what we've done is taken our intervention, brought in overweight cancer survivors, and now our coaches are working to help them increase their physical activity and decrease steadily over time their weight. And you can see we have astounding results. And inversely, the graph about the physical activity looks the same. So we are very excited about this, these data, very excited. The other thing that's of interest, and I, I put this slide in because it's so important and we're just now learning how to capture these data. It's what our survivors tell us this garden does for them and to them. It's their perceptions of how they feel. And they have started to call it their urban oasis. So think about the cancer chaos. Think about people, especially genetic or not, they get diagnosed with cancer, they're not healthcare professionals. They don't feel like they have a lot of control, right? What our cancer survivors tell us is they can come to this garden that is their space and their place and they can be with other people on the same journey as they are in. And it becomes this um, indirect support group, right? And it also brings them back to this sense of peace and tranquility, not only getting them in touch with where their food comes from, but also getting them in touch with not just the seasons of the year, the growing seasons, but the cycle of life, and it's just profound. So you remember that little seed in the soil, right? I believe our data is showing exactly what I said, that we can take cancer survivors and we can help them to craft a different environment. We can give them confidence and control of their behaviors, and we can change cancer outcomes. The soil and the environment absolutely does matter. Now I want to take a full circle back to my family. And this is a picture that was taken this summer of my surviving uh, siblings and my mother. My father was also an LFS cancer and he, um, LFS carrier, excuse me, and he passed some years ago. And the other thing I want to mention is choice. So lifestyle behaviors are a matter of choice. Sometimes people need some help and support in making that choice. But I'll never forget, and now I ask myself this question every day when I wake up, when my sister had had a particularly horrific time and she was about on her 20th procedure, I remember just going up to her and saying, how do you do this? How do you do this every single day? And she looked at me and said, I see it as I make a choice. Every day I wake up, and I can either go about the business of living or the business of dying. And I choose living. Thank you.